Now I'd like to introduce our distinguished speaker for this year's ceremony, uh, Dr. Nina Banks. Nina Banks is Associate Professor of Economics at Bucknell University and an affiliated, affiliated faculty member in the Department of Women and Gender Studies and Critical Black Studies. Her publications focus on social reproduction in migrant households, Black women in work, and the economics of the first Black economist in the U.S., Sadie Tanner Mossel Alexander. Professor Banks teaches courses on U.S. women's economic history, gender and migration, and poverty in the U.S., and she's the inaugural director of the Bucknell in Ghana Study Abroad Program. Dr. Banks is also a faculty mentor for the Diversity Initiative for Tenure in Economics Program. She serves on the board of directors of the National Economic Association and the editorial boards of Feminist Economics and the Review of Black Political Economy. She organized the first joint annual Freedom and Justice Conference of the National Associate, Economic Association and the American Society for Hispanic Economists. And she received her doctorate in economics from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. The lecture today by Professor Banks is entitled Sadie Alexander, Race and the Economic Rights of Citizenship. All right, good afternoon or good evening. I'm in a different time zone, so I, I guess it's evening in both places. Um, thank you, Professor Lopez, for your introduction. I'd like to thank the Department of Economics for inviting me here to talk about Sadie Alexander on this wonderful occasion to celebrate the Foster Award recipients. I am delighted to be here with you today. In long memory, the Black experience in America, Mary Frances Berry and John Blassingame said that the presence of Black people in the Republic has always stood as America's accuser. In other words, the subjugation of Black people through enslavement, Jim Crow exclusion, and racial tyranny has always exposed the lie of equal rights, opportunities, and protections for all Americans. In the mid 20th century, one of the leading civil rights voices challenging Black exclusion and lack of protections was Sadie Tanner Marcel Alexander, and she did so by using arguments tied to economic justice. It's also very likely that up until now, you have heard very little about Sadie Alexander, even though she was one of the most accomplished people, not just in the US, but also in the world during her lifetime. Sadie Alexander has been lost in historical memory since she lived during a time when black Americans had extremely limited opportunities for professional work, and the work that they performed usually was unseen and unrecorded by most white Americans. I became aware of Sadie Alexander when I was a graduate student in economics at UMass Amherst in the 1990s. Good. A graduate student friend in the Department of History introduced me to Sadie Alexander. Sadie Alexander was an entry in the newly released volume, Black Women in America, and it noted that Alexander was the first Black woman to earn a doctorate degree in economics in the United States. And I wondered, of course, why I had never heard of Sadie Alexander as an undergraduate student who majored in economics or as a graduate student in an economics program. And then a few years later, around 1997, while I was still a graduate student writing a dissertation in the new emerging field of feminist economics, I ran across Sadie Alexander's 1930 Opportunity Magazine article, Negro Women in Our Economic Life. It's the only um, economic article that she published, um, but it was published not in an economic journal, but by the National Urban League. Um, and so when I saw it in the late 1990s, it was in an anthology of African-American feminist thought that I was using in a class that I was teaching with a political science professor. The short article, and I have a picture of it up on the screen, the short article piqued my curiosity because Sadie Alexander in 1930 was discussing ideas that were at the very heart of feminist economic analysis some 70 years later. And finally then, after reading an article by economist Julianne Malveaux that discussed the loss to the nation and the economics profession in particular from Sadie Alexander's inability 
to become hired as an economist because of racial and gender discrimination, it motivated me to go to the University of Pennsylvania where Sadie Alexander's papers are stored to look through her records in order to determine if she had continued to display an interest in economic issues, right? So at the time, people believed that after that she had given up her interest in economics. While going through her files, I was thrilled to discover that Sadie Alexander had delivered speeches primarily to African-American audiences that demonstrated that she had in fact maintained a lifelong focus on the economic status of African-Americans. And so I became determined to restore Sadie Alexander's life and work as an economist to the economics profession. The more that I made my way through this huge collection of over 81 archival boxes, I came to realize that Sadie Alexander's significance went well beyond the economics profession. And so I'm writing a biography of her life in addition to the book of her speeches that my publisher released on the 100th anniversary to the day of when she received her doctorate degree on June 15, 1921. So I would like to tell you a little bit about Sadie Alexander before I discuss her ideas on race and the economic rights of citizenship. Sadie Tanner Marcel was born in 1898 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Her parents were from prominent and highly accomplished African-American families. Marcel's father, his name was Aaron Marcel Jr., was the first African-American to graduate from the University of Pennsylvania's law school. But a year after Marcel was born, her father left his wife and three children. Her mother, Mary Tanner Marcel, suffering from embarrassment, moved the family to Washington, D.C. to live near her sister and brother-in-law. Sadie Mosell lived between Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia for most of her childhood. While living in Washington, D.C., she attended the prestigious all-Black M Street High School, where she was exposed to the ideas of leading Black scholars and activists, such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Carter Woodson. Marcel graduated in 1915 from the M Street School, and then she moved back to Philadelphia to attend the University of Pennsylvania. She acknowledged the importance of the content of her education when she later said that her education in Black history at the M Street School gave her confidence that she could succeed at the University of Pennsylvania. Marcel's confidence, and hereafter I'm going to refer to her by her married name, Alexander, was certainly tested at various points in her education at the University of Pennsylvania, both in the classroom and outside of it. Nonetheless, she excelled as a student, graduating in just three years with highest honors, and then she entered into the university's graduate program first in history, before then switching into economics. In 1921, she became the first African-American person, not just woman, but the first African-American person in the nation to receive a doctorate degree in economics. Unable to obtain employment as an economist, however, Alexander went on to earn a law degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1927. Um, and when she did that, she became the first Black woman in the state of Pennsylvania to get a law degree. The speeches that Sadie Alexander gave during the decades of the 1920s, the 1930s, and the 1940s discussed the major challenges that African Americans confronted as they migrated from the South to, to the North during the World War I Great Migration Era as they faced high levels of unemployment during the Great Depression, but were excluded from New Deal labor protections, and as they confronted rising racial intolerance during the World War II era. Each of these three moments in African-American history, in American history, the Great Migration, Great Depression, and World War II shaped Sadie Alexander's views on race and the economic rights of citizenship. 
The first key moment, the great migration of African Americans from the South to the North, was the subject of Sadie Alexander's doctoral dissertation. She conducted field research by visiting the homes of 100 migrant families in the 29th Ward of Philadelphia in order to determine the obstacles that Southern Black migrants to the city encountered in trying to earn a living in the city. She studied the degree to which they were able to earn a living wage that would enable them to adjust to life in Philadelphia. The African-American population began leaving the South in large numbers in 1916 in response to the increased demand for Black workers in Northern industries during World War I. They had hoped to finally be able to gain a foothold in the more highly paid jobs in the industrial sector that had been open only to white men. They also hope to achieve greater freedoms and opportunities for themselves and their children by migrating to northward destinations and leaving behind the system of Jim Crow segregation and disenfranchisement that prevented them from enjoying full participation as citizens. African Americans also left communities in the South because they were fleeing from the vagaries of racial violence. Racial violence, however, accompanied the migrants on their journey north in the World War I era. White racial terror of African Americans occurred during the war as a reaction to their migration. It occurred after the war ended in 1918 when white soldiers returned home and were outraged by the presence of African Americans living and working in Northern cities that they considered to be their spaces. And it especially occurred during the economic downturn after the war ended when vets faced economic uncertainty with rising levels of unemployment. This racial violence led Sadie Alexander to view economic uncertainty over the state of the economy and the availability of jobs, not as the cause of racial violence, but as an accelerant to white mob violence stating of white mob violence in the post-war period, quote, unemployment did not cause the riots, but rather fear that production cutbacks would leave workers stranded. The men at the top knew that reconversion to peacetime production would supply jobs, but the workers only knew that the war jobs with high wages were gone and high prices remained. The fear of what might happen put men in a mood to fight for jobs and wherever that struggle took a racial turn, there was trouble, end of quote. This awful period of post-war racial violence, exacerbated by economic uncertainty, left an imprint on Sadie Alexander's views of the corrosive effects of unemployment. The second key moment that shaped Sadie Alexander's thinking was the Great Depression, and New Deal policies that the Roosevelt administration put into place in order to address the Depression. During the Great Depression, Black Americans experienced greater economic hardship than white Americans did since their unemployment rates of at least 50% were over twice as high as the national unemployment rate of 25% at the peak of the Great Depression, yet the government often left Black Americans to fend for themselves. Sadie Alexander had hoped that the Roosevelt administration would enact policies that improved the economic condition of African Americans, saying that it would be the first time since Reconstruction when there was even the possibility that government would improve conditions for Black Americans. New Deal policies, however, excluded domestic service and agriculture, the main sectors in which African-Americans worked from the important new labor protections, including minimum wages, overtime pay, and collective bargaining rights. This left black workers especially vulnerable to workplace exploitation. Along with employers relegating Black workers into low-paid jobs that white workers did not want to perform, 
Black workers had already been more vulnerable to layoffs and firings because of the persistence of employment discrimination based on race. Sadie Alexander observed that these New Deal policies that provided benefits and labor protections to white workers and not black workers had the effect of worsening the economic position of black workers relative to white workers, even though the language in the laws was racially neutral, seemingly racially neutral. In other words, there was no language that stipulated that only white workers would benefit. Nonetheless, the policies had a disparate impact on black workers. The disparate impact of these policies on black Americans made Sadie Alexander a proponent of race conscious policies that could explicitly address racial disparities. And this was how the second key moment shaped Sadie Alexander's thinking on matters of policy and race the need for race conscious policies to benefit African Americans. As a lawyer, Sadie Alexander often focused on the unfair application of laws that prevented African Americans from exercising constitutional rights, such as voting, serving on juries, and having freedom from unwarranted searches and seizures. However, she came to embrace a more expansive view of citizens' rights that included economic rights along with the more conventional political rights. Her views of the economic rights of citizenship evolved out of events that occurred during the World War II era, which was the third key moment. In 1939, Sadie Alexander became alarmed that white Americans across the nation seemed to be emboldened in openly expressing racial intolerance. She compared events that were occurring in the United States with events that she saw in Germany in the early 1930s while on a trip there with her husband, Raymond Pace Alexander. She witnessed Germans racially scapegoating Jews and blaming them for the country's economic problems. In the US, in the late 1930s, there was open hostility towards immigrants and religious and racially marginalized groups by public figures. In a speech that Alexander gave in 1939, she stated, quote, dissatisfaction and discontent with the economic condition of the country have given rise to the race baiting speeches of such men as Father Coughlin and Major Van Horn Mosley to the cry for an American party. Northwestern Pennsylvania, which has always been friendly in its attitude towards Negroes, carried the Republican ticket in the recent gubernatorial campaign to victory on the fact that every man on the ticket was an American Protestant. It is a common expression to hear from the man on the street, Hitler is right. And when he says it to a Negro, Rest assured, he has no more respect for you than for the Jew on whom Hitler is placing the blame for a world economic condition put in motion when the German troops in 1914 goose stepped into Belgium, end of quote. Sadie Alexander believed that racial demagoguery by public figures could inflame and worsen white workers' sense of economic discontent, leading to an increase in racial scapegoating and violence, stating, quote, the right of all individuals to earn a decent living must be achieved if we here at home and throughout the world are to have the kind of life we call a democracy. We have seen in Europe how the desire of one group to exploit and take the jobs of another has led to the development of elaborate theories attempting to justify intolerance, end of quote. This quote calls attention to Sadie Alexander's concern that economic insecurity and the escalation of racial intolerance had the potential to lead to restrictions on the freedoms, 
and liberties of scapegoated communities. To counter this tendency, Sadie Alexander believed that we needed to have economic reforms that provided for greater economic security and that we needed to have adult economic literacy campaigns so that people understood how economies recover from downturns, saying, quote, while we are awaiting the results of these governmental efforts to provide economic security, which is a foundation for democratic security, minorities must be alert that the pressure of discontented majorities does not destroy whatever benefits of democracy we now enjoy. What should be our program? First, it should include a plan for adult education in the principles of economic security that underlie democratic principles. We must further realize that the presence in our midst of no minority group creates economic problems, but that they are the creatures of an uncontrolled economy. We must understand that the promises of no one man can bring prosperity, but that the working out of the principles of economy underlying the structure of any country are dependent upon the combined efforts of all people. The cause of economic insecurity and how it can be overcome must be made clear to all classes of the public in language that each can understand in order that America may await the orderly solution of the problem and not in despair turn over its freedom in exchange for the vain promises of a self-proclaimed Messiah. 1939, end of quote. President Roosevelt also believed that economic insecurity made it likely that people could become susceptible to manipulation by despots. In January of 1944, in his State of the Union address, President Roosevelt called for a second Bill of Rights or an economic Bill of Rights to provide a, quote, new basis of security and prosperity, end of quote. He believed that the transformation of the economy since its founding from an agrarian economy into an industrial economy required that we expand citizens' rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in recognition of the economic changes. President Roosevelt stated that the right to a job should be included in the new Economic Bill of Rights. He also stated that it was, quote, self-evident that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence, end of quote. And he went on to say that, quote, people who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of which dictatorships are made, end of quote. Sadie Alexander took President Roosevelt's concern over economic insecurity and the danger it posed to democratic rule in the U.S. a step further by linking it to racial violence. She delivered a speech in early 1945 at Florida A&M College that discussed the racial implications of economic insecurity. She began by linking the freedom from want and fear that were expressed in the Atlantic Charter to the provision of jobs, stating, quote, freedom from want and freedom from fear cannot be attained at home when hordes of unemployed men and women are pounding the city streets and bargaining on street corners against each other for a chance to do a day's work. I hold it the obligation of every American to remove those inequities which have crept into our national life and caused men to fear want and to fear each other, end of quote. And so as the U.S. approached the end of World War II, Sadie Alexander became very concerned about the 40% cutback in employment 
that the War Production Board estimated would take place once the war ended. Alexander was concerned that economic insecurity would increase racial violence and undermine the rule of law. In her speech, she drew on lessons from World War I, where economic uncertainty due to the loss of jobs and perceptions of black social mobility fueled white anger and led to over 30 incidents of violence during the Red Summer of 1919, where white mobs terrorized black men, women, and children across the country, killing hundreds of black people and destroying their homes, businesses, and communities. Because of government's ability to achieve near full employment during World War II through public works programs, such as the Civilian Conservation Corps and Works Progress Administration, Sadie Alexander stated that the federal government should maintain full employment policies after the war ended. Importantly, she also recognized that full employment would counter the persistent employment discrimination the black workers faced, stating, quote, anything short of full employment, a marginal worker is pressing the brick on the streets looking for work, which creates fear in fellow workers and racial friction, and the Negro will continue to be the marginal worker so long as he has less seniority than other workers. Full employment would mean for the Negro worker continuing occupational advancement, increased seniority, and the removal of fears of economic rivalry on the part of his fellow white workers. Full employment is the only solution to the economic subjugation of the Negro and of the great masses of white labor. Full employment, she said, is the only solution to the economic subjugation of the Negro and of the great masses of white labor, end of quote. In fact, Alexander went even further than simply calling for government to provide full employment. She maintained that it was a right of citizenship. All people who wanted a job and were willing and able to work should be entitled to jobs. She called for economic reforms that would make it less likely that white Americans would resort to fascism as a way of dealing with hunger, homelessness, and other manifestations of economic insecurity. She stated, quote, it is therefore obvious that the maintenance of democratic institutions in America depends first upon the development of an economic system which as stated by the National Policy Committee, will provide an adequate measure of economic security and justice, end of quote. So the questions then were, how could the U.S. ensure a fully employed labor force that also provided an adequate measure of economic security and justice? Sadie Alexander believed that we could achieve both post-war full employment with economic security and justice by the government implementing public works programs that created jobs to address pressing social needs rather than simply investing in roads and bridges. Her plan relied on a jobs program that would combat illiteracy, hunger, lack of clothing and substandard housing. She stated that, quote, these are needs which demand the production of goods, end of quote. In other words, the government could continue to achieve full employment in the post-war period by using the nation's geared up industrial plants and available labor to produce goods that provided for basic needs that provided freedom from deprivation. 
the economic programs that she advocated provided economic justice through an equitable redistribution of national income, through increased wages and benefits, and government job guarantees for all people who wanted to work. She believed that this would improve living standards for poor and low-income workers and diminish employers' ability to threaten workers with job loss. Importantly, she also believed that this would likely decrease racial tensions that accompany competition over limited jobs. To finance the additional jobs, Sadie Alexander recommended that we implement a taxation policy that would tax businesses so that their excess profits could be used to finance the public works programs. Of course, increasing the number of jobs within the economy would also stimulate economic growth through increased consumption, as well as generate tax revenue from the additional jobs. So the third key moment of World War II led Sadie Alexander to view the right to work as an economic right of citizenship that was fundamental to our democracy. And I would like to conclude by thinking about the ways in which Sadie Alexander's ideas on race and the economic rights of citizenship continue to be relevant to our political economy today. Certainly the election of Donald Trump, who engaged in racial demagoguery by stoking white Americans' economic and cultural anxieties shows the ongoing danger that economic uncertainty can pose for the nation. Of course, white Americans of all classes, not just those who faced economic uncertainty, put Donald Trump into office, but we cannot overlook the role that economic uncertainty and rising economic inequality also played in his election. For many white Americans, economic uncertainty is linked to structural changes in the economy since the 1970s with the decline in manufacturing and the growth in lower paid non-union service jobs and employers' ability to resist union demands. Sadie Alexander believed that if white workers recognize their commonality with black workers, rather than perceiving them as job rivals, unions could be strengthened and better able to bargain on behalf of workers. She also believed that we needed adult economic literacy campaigns to explain how government policy can correct downturns in the macro economy and that this was necessary in order to diminish racial scapegoating. In an era where disinformation and racial hate speech is widely disseminated via social media and where communities are banning books that discuss our nation's history of structural racial oppression, Sadie Alexander's arguments are especially compelling. I spoke to an economist from the New York Fed last fall about Sadie Alexander's recommendations and she remarked that it sounded a lot like the Biden administration's Build Back Better plan. And I agreed with her that there were overlaps since at least 80 years ago, Sadie Alexander focused on the need to elevate living standards and provide for economic security by having public works programs that focused on social infrastructure rather than just physical infrastructure, by addressing the needs of the poor through a stronger safety net, through greater access to healthcare, and by research and investments in jobs for the future. Alexander was a strong proponent of women having gainful employment so that they could have economic independence, and she believed that children were better served by being placed in high-quality daycare centers. 
Sadie Alexander made recommendations for all of that and more, including minimum wages indexed to inflation and government job guarantees as a right of citizenship, right? And I want you to, to, to think about that. 80 years ago, our nation's first African-American economist put forth ideas that we are just now really grappling with um, at the national level. Um, and so the discrimination that she experienced wasn't just detrimental to her. Um, the discrimination that people experience more generally isn't just detrimental to them, um, but it also means that it robs our nation of many of our best minds. But at the core of Sadie Alexander's analysis was the focus on African-Americans, people who had always experienced economic precarity because of racial oppression and for whom a federal job guarantee would go a long way towards diminishing racial discrimination in employment and the detrimental effects of joblessness on people's lives. As for the Build Back Better program, however ambitious it may have once been, it would not be sufficient to address the magnitude of systemic problems and racial inequities that Black Americans confront and that have accumulated in the aftermath and legacy of slavery, so clearly visible through the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on Black Americans with respect to deaths, comorbidities, jobs, wealth holding, care work, medical treatment, and food insecurity. Sadie Alexander's economic thinking always reflected the new challenges that African Americans faced in the unrelenting system of racial oppression. Indeed, her economic thought was within an institutional framework that analyzed structural and ideological factors that sustained black oppression. In the 1960s, Sadie Alexander spoke out about the systemic structural oppression that circumscribed the lives of African-Americans through disparities in housing, policing, education, and jobs saying, quote, it is a tragic reflection upon America's claim to world leadership that racial riots from coast to coast had to awaken the nation to the realization that instead of a great society, we have produced ghettos, slums, and shocking inequities in public school education in the North and the South as well as in the East and on the West Coast, end of quote. She called for race conscious compensatory opportunities for African-Americans in jobs, education and housing in order to remedy past injustices. That would include programs such as affirmative action in jobs and education and affordable housing programs it would certainly include reparations for slavery. Finally, on what was needed in order to create a society that provided economic security and justice, Sadie Alexander stated in 1963, during the midst of the civil rights racial justice movement, quote, what is required is a comprehensive plan and a total process in which government, industry, labor, and the public schools and the representatives of the organized community join together to provide those who have not participated and shared fully in our society the assurance in concrete ways that they truly have an equal chance. We must provide the hope and the certainty of productive employment to everyone, and especially to Negro young people. The basic purpose of this comprehensive design, this total process, is the development of the deprived, the neglected, the discriminated against, the minority, 
to its full potential. This is necessary not only to meet the ends of social justice and morality, to fulfill the guarantees of our constitution and laws, but because in this era of automation, when tens of thousands of unskilled and semi-skilled jobs are being eliminated, it becomes an economic imperative which is basic to our very existence as a free society. What I am saying is that Negro children have to feel that they have as much of a chance as any white child to get that job, live in that suburban house, go to that particular school. To do this, we are going to have to do a lot more than change the self-image of Negroes. We're going to have to restructure our society. Thank you. And I, I think I have time for questions, is that correct? Um, a lot of positive response. I started this in, I don't know if I mentioned this in here or not, but I started this work in 2003 when I was just an assistant professor venturing out um, to you know, see if I could find something that indicated that Sadie Alexander was thinking about economic issues. Um, and so it has been a long, difficult undertaking. Um, I had small children and the archives was not located near um, where we live. Um, and so the it was 2003, I published on it. Um, and by 2014, my university funded the research. I couldn't get external funding for this because I'm not a historian. And economists um, tend to you know, do research that is, is quantitative. Um, so it had low value in those days. I went to the archives um, every summer with my children starting in 2014. They weren't at the archives. They were in Philadelphia with me. Um, and you know, I published a piece in 2008 um, that I drew on heavily in this piece, which focused on the black worker and economic justice. And that was, you know, we're talking about the Great Recession. And so that was co that coincided with um, the emergence of the rethinking economics movement. So students at Oberlin were really energized by the rethinking um, economics movement. They read this piece, um, invited me to come out and give a talk. That was really the beginning of um, me publicly disseminating, you know, rather than just through journal articles, but giving talks. Um, and podcast on Sadie Alexander. And so it has been really well received um, over the last few years. Um, and I think that there is a lot of an excitement that, um, that I was able to recover her economic thought. I mean, her thought was extraordinary. Um, and she is the only economist, right? The only economist who lived through all of these major episodes or most of the major episodes that affected African-Americans throughout the 20th century, the Great Migration, World War I, right? Great Depression, New Deal, World War II, all the way into the early 70s um, in terms of deindustrialization. So she is the only economist who not only lived through it, but also wrote about it, who spoke about it, right? Because I reconstructed her speeches. Um, and so that knowledge was lost to the economics profession had I not um, used my skills and archival research to go in and try to excavate her, her economic thought. So I think a lot of people have um, you know, really appreciated her, her insights, especially people from um, the modern monetary school, modern, modern monetary Theory, thank you, right? Because one of the things that I realized is that, um, you know, 1945, when Sadie Alexander was talking about um, government jobs, that everybody was entitled, um, everybody should have access to a job, the government should, should guarantee this, that it really meant that, that Sadie Alexander was the first economist who was um, talking about and promoting the idea of a federal job guarantee, um, not Hyman Minsky, 
Um, and, and so surprisingly, you know, the MMT people um, embraced Sadie Alexander none, nonetheless. So um, I think it's been very well received. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you know, and her education is really fascinating because she had, she was ostracized and shunned as an undergraduate student. Women were in the Department of Education. And so that's where she was and her white classmates really shunned her. Um, and then later when she went to law school, she was again marginalized um, by the dean of the law school. But I, one thing that I have never found um, evidence of is mistreatment on the part of her economic faculty. That seems to be, you know, a really important period of her education where she was very much supported and encouraged by her faculty. I mean, there are places where she talks about being treated like a pet. Um, uh, they ensure they knew her work was important. They wanted to make sure that she had funding for it. So she was in a very supportive environment. Um, I talk about this in the book that um, Raymond Bai lent her his doctoral hood to wear when she graduated, um, and it was a hood that his mother um, had sewn. Uh, so when she was in graduate school, right, in the early part of the 20th century, the curriculum was much more interdisciplinary. She took courses, right, she started out as, his, as a history student, and then she switched into econ, but she continued to take history courses. So she, she had European histories and American history courses. She took sociology courses, econ courses, um, insurance. That was her minor area. So, I, you know, I think of her as an institutional economist, um, not because I know so much about the, the, the influence that her faculty had on her, but rather what she did with her economic knowledge. Um, she, was interest, she was, you know, interested in, demo, you know, issues of democracy, world affairs, um, I think, early on. And that was in part, I think, um, due to the influence of at least one of her professors. Um, and let me, let me just also add, because I think, you know, interdisciplinary education is really important um, in, in terms of her ability to construct this, you know, really rich understanding of structural and ideological factors um, at play in sustaining racial oppression. But the other thing that is really significant about her education and you know, the early education of economists is that she did field research. You know, she was in the trenches. She went, she went to the homes of 100 black families, knocked on their doors, went into their homes and interviewed them. So field research was, I think, very much appreciated still. Um, and, um, you know, I think we've moved away from that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you'll have to remind me because I'm, 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 I'm forgetful when it, you know, when it comes to uh, several um, questions. So, okay, so she was actually really influenced in high school at that M Street School by Carter Woodson, right? More, Carter Woodson, Carter Woodson is the father of African American history. So he influenced her thinking on the importance of African American history and always talking about the contributions of African Americans um, and the achievements of African Americans. Um, you know, I have an article that is my first article that I published on Sadie Alexander. Um, Black Women and Racial Advancement, The Economics of Sadie T.M. Alexander. It's the first analysis of Sadie Alexander's body of intellectual thought, right, through her speeches. Um, and what I really argue in that is that Sadie Alexander's um, intellectual thought was tied to a long tradition of other African-American women who were activists. Right, so I, I situate her work within that tradition. Certainly, you know, later on in the 1930s and 40s, when I read her work uh, in the nine, and she flips, right? So she, over a period of time, she becomes more um, progressive. In the 1920s, 
Um, you know, she's, uh, I think, um, thinking about African Americans through the prism of her social class position more than anything else. And so she's embracing ideas of, you know, African Americans have to avail themselves of all of these amazing opportunities, but the opportunities don't materialize. Um, and then she moves into the 1930s and she's hopeful um, that the New Deal legislation will address these inequities. It doesn't, right? And she worries that, you know, now African Americans are going to be worse off, which, of course, if we think about the end of the New Deal period with the GI Bill, that happens. Um, and, and so her strategies are off, always shifting, um, you know, which is something that I really appreciated about, about her thinking is that she was very flexible in her thinking. And, um, and I've referred to her in, um, elsewhere as a pragmatic visionary is how I would describe her, her, her thinking. Um, but certainly, you know, I would compare her thinking to Keynes in terms of her, her macroeconomics. And then your other question was... Oh yeah, yeah, she gave most of her speeches to black audiences, varied, right? So, uh, you know, she's highly educated um, African-American. And so she was in great demand within the African-American community. Um, you know, the you know various branches of the National Urban League asked her to talk. Churches often asked her to speak, um, you know, other civic organizations. And then um, in the 1940s, she was appointed by President Truman to serve on his civil rights committee. And that committee was the most important civil rights committee that had been formed up until that time. And they issued a really important report called To Secure These Rights, which looked at the provision of civil rights across the country um, and the way in which um, the practice diverged from, um, from the stated ideals. Um, so after the committee issued that report at the end of 1947, Sadie Alexander's, um, I guess, notoriety increased. And so she was often, she was in even greater demand as a speaker. Um, and, you know, when I started doing this research on her, I, there were really two questions that I wanted to know. How could... Um, you know, so the first question was, did she have an economic, you know, continue to have economic interest? Yes, right. It's through her speeches delivered to uh, black audiences. And the other question was, how is it possible um, in the 1930s for an African-American woman with a demanding career as a lawyer, how is it possible for, for her to have that career and balance child care responsibilities? Right. So that, you know. Anyway, I kept going back and doing more and more um, research. I had a hard time pulling away from this. Um, the last summer that I went was 2019. And if COVID hadn't hit, I would have been there 2020 as well, because her files are just extraordinary. Really difficult to pull away from them. Oh, yeah, I'm going to talk about that in the biography, <laughs> right? Uh, she had a lot of help. Um, but, you know, that's the that's the short way of saying something, you know, which is actually quite profound in terms of, you know, one of the, you know, one of the things that I found out. Um, but, yeah, she had a lot of help. She had when the children were were young babies, her sister, her sister lived. I'm a native Pennsylvanian. Sadie Alexander is a native Pennsylvanian. We're the only two African-American women from the state of Pennsylvania to have doctorate degrees in economics. Um, and her sister lived for a while in my hometown, um, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Um, and so her sister provided care for the children during some of the summer months when they were little. They had, um, they had um, what are they called? What were they called? Nurses, uh, right? So nannies at times. They had a man in their household who provided a lot of care. Um, so she had a lot of help from family and friends and people within the household who provided um, services to her. But again, the story is much more interesting than that. Yes. 
Well, you know, so the objective for me was to piece together her economic thought so that other economists could then use it. Um, her speeches were in very poor shape. Um, the, the, you know, the early speeches would literally disintegrate around the edges as I held them. Um, you know, some of her files, I should say, um, and the speeches that I, that I use were, were copied. Um, but her handwriting was really difficult to read. And the speeches had strikeouts and crossouts. And I just, you know, it, it was extremely difficult to be able to um, reconstruct her economic thought. And so I had a research assistant in um, 2018 who worked with me for two academic years and even into a summer, um, you know, working on those speeches, right? Um, so, right, we released the speeches and now they are available and um, I'm aware of two other economists, um, Edith Cooper, um, who's a feminist economist, and her area is also history of economic thought, who has started doing research on Sadie Alexander on the basis of those speeches. I'm thrilled by that. Um, and the other person is Daniel Kuhn, um, who is a labor economist. Um, and Daniel is doing some, he's doing a couple of things. You know, he's looking at her relationship to Du Bois. Um, and um, there's another, oh, he's also doing, you know, a focus on her early life, um, um, you know, in some other directions as well. So, so yes. So finally, some economists are also doing this work and it's, it's hard work, right? So, so some economists, I think, are tempted to do a shortcut around actually doing historical research. Daniel and Edith are not. They are doing it the right way. I saw, yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so the general theory was published in 36, right? 36. Um, and so she never mentions Keynes at all. Um, and right, and in in the 19, oh, when was it? 1920s or early 30s, there's some period where she was basically a fiscal conservative. But World War, World War II really shifted her thinking in a profound way in terms of the, the role of government in the economy. Um, so she never mentioned Keynes, but I, um, yeah, her work I think is very much consistent with Keynes in terms of, um, you know, aggregate demand management. Thank you.